got Vishish Vaswani, who's coming from SF as well. Uh, he'll be talking about self-attention, which is what he spent the last couple of years uh, working on. So over to you. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Ashish, um, and I'm a Google AI. I'm a researcher there. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, hopefully convince you why self-attention is a good inductive bias for language images and music. I assure you it's worked on other tasks as well, but this is something I'm interested in and I've focused on for the last few years, so this is uh, what I'm happy talking about. Uh, first, a shout out to my fantastic and brilliant collaborators at Google. Uh, none of this would have been possible without them. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Okay, so if you're working uh, in language, you better, I mean, and, and deep learning, you better be building models that are good at learning uh, representations of variable length data. Uh, so a standard, uh, the, the, the many problems can be cast as uh, variable length uh, problems from variable length inputs to variable length outputs like translation or summarization or language modeling, no input, variable length output. And a pretty standard workhorse for even now and for a long time has, have been recurrent neural networks. Uh, they're a very natural fit because uh, they're able to, to produce representations one at a time. And some of the more popular variants have been the ones that explicitly add multiplicative interactions like uh, LSTMs and GRUs. Um, so how does, an L, how does how do these typically, what's a cartoon for these for RNNs? They sort of slurp the input one position at a time and produce a representation that summarizes everything in the past. And um, now, what are some of the problems, or what are some of the desiderata that, that lead us to this, to to this attention-based model? So sequential computation is slow. Uh, if you can run more, more experiments, you can potentially get better results. But also modern hardware is, is you, you, ideally, you'd like to exploit modern hardware to, to, to do computation at every position simultaneously. Uh, but see, because sequential computation treats a position one, one at a time, you can't parallelize it. Uh, also, you have this one single hidden state that you need to cram all the information about your past. So if you want to model hierarchy or if you model, want to model coreference relationships, you have to pass it through the single hidden state that can be inefficient. Um, so uh, convolutional sequence models that we inherited from vision had this, uh, were, were, they worked really well. There were a couple of great language models, also good machine translation models. And uh, they were trivial to parallelize. You could actually compute representations at every position in parallel. Um, and they, they work because a lot of important uh, dependencies are mostly local. And uh, however, if you sort of wanted to model like long distance or, or distant relationships between two faraway positions, you had to still have many layers because these were essentially local. Um, now, attention has been critical or uh, had been, ha is, continues to be critical for, for modeling sort of, you know, these, these encoder decoder relationships where you want to summarize uh, via content based mechanism a, a lot of information from your encoder. So then we asked this question why don't we use attention, only attention, in a machine translation model to learn our representations? That's the primary workhorse. Um, so, what's the sort of a very basic cartoon of how attention would work? So. Attention is, 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 is just like, it's, you first have a notion of uh, content-based similarity. So imagine you want to compute a representation for the word represent. Uh, you, have some, you have some embedding. And you're going to summarize all the content around you um, um, based on some notion of content-based similarity, some compatibility. So you're going to see how, how compatible is my representation with all my neighbors. And based on this, you're going to pool information. If you, like, if you prefer the language of convolutions, you can imagine that attention is nothing but just content-based pooling. Um, so, so what, what, so what do we get with this kind of basic mechanism? You're able to, you're able to essentially get, uh, just in one hop, you're able to link any two distant positions. Uh, the, the mechanisms, this sort of, pro, like when you do, when you do, when you compute compatibility, these are usually product operations, uh, and you'll typically sort of normalize them. That gives you, get, that gives you multiplicative interactions just by virtue of the computation, gives you gating. Uh, it's again trivial to parallelize because at every position, you can essentially attend to every other position in parallel. Uh, so now, again, going back, could this replace sequential computation uh, entirely? And I mean, of course, I'm here, so the answer is yes. But uh, some great work that had been done using self-attention uh, in the past, a lot of it had been sort of using self-attention, you know, sort of in, in the scaffold of recurrent neural networks or sort of using it for text understanding, but nothing had really sort of scaled it up to large scale machine translation. Um, so sort of everything comes together in our model, which we call the transformer. And it's, it's the, we, have, we follow some, a standard encoder decoder architecture. And uh, so the encoder is a, a stack of uh, self-attention and feed forward layers. Uh, 
and the decoder is a stack of uh, decoder self-attention that essentially simulates a language model, followed by encoder-decoder attention uh, and a feed-forward feed layer, and the, at the end you have a standard cross-entropy loss. Um, so, let's, uh, let's, so let's zoom into what, the, what our specific uh, attention operation looks like, and we were, just, we were basically going for simplicity. Uh, so imagine you have this position E2, you want to represent it, that forms your query. All the content around you forms the keys. These, you, you create queries and keys by, by linear transformation. So essentially, you just, it's, it's, just a, you, and, uh, it's just a bilinear form. So you have queries, keys, and then based on your compatibilities, which is just a matrix multiplication and a softmax, um, you get a convex combination of how much information you, you need to pool from your neighborhood. And based on, based on these weights, you essentially pool that information through, through values. And the square root operation is just to make sure that your attention weights don't blow up. Uh, so this is easily parallelizable. It's just two MATMLs on a, and, and modern hardware can, can compute this function very easily. Um, on the decoder side, again, um, there's masking so that we, we only license uh, positions that appeared before you because uh, even though we can train in parallel, we decode autoregressively, so we can't, look, we can't peek into the future. Um, so why is it cheap? So compared to all these other computational paradigms that I mentioned, attention is uh, the, our computational complexity is quadratic in the number of positions. And in the regime of machine translation, it's, it's very favorable because uh, typically the number of positions don't dominate your hidden dimension, which is like 512 or 1024. Um, okay, so... So in terms of computation, we are much better. However, like if, you're doing, if, you're, if you're dealing with language, you often want to, want to find the answer to the question, who did what to whom, right? And convolutions have these sort of different linear transformations for different positions. So you can imagine they're sort of combining different pieces of information from these different representations in these positions. But attention, on the other hand, is just sort of a, is just an averaging effect. So you can't combine, like you can't take like half of the representation of who and, and like another half of the representation of did what. So to solve this or to simulate convolutions, we essentially just run multiple attention layers in parallel at the same time. And, and, and none of them are dependent on each other. They're operating in parallel. So this is, again, parallelizable. So this is what we call multi-head attention. Um, so um, uh, when, we, when we trained our, I, at, at the time of the publication, our model was state of the art. We outperformed all the other, we outperformed convolution sequence models and, and LSTM-based models, uh, the best LSTM-based models at the time. And our models were three times faster um, because essentially it, they were very easy to parallelize. We had very few layers. And um, I mean, you can also argue that essentially what we're doing in deep learning is just building architectures that are better for SGD. And attention is just a linear combination of things. So, gradient, so it's very easy for gradients to travel through. So one can argue that that was a big advantage. But I, I mean, it's a virtue. And, uh, and also getting these sort of constant path length interactions obviously help. We have some visualizations in the paper that detect like heads actually forming, doing some kind of co-reference, some heads actually learning some convolutional nature. Um, so if you're using, so if, if you care about learning hierarchy and getting constant path length interactions between uh, your, your tokens in a sequence, which is, which is something that's essential for language, then self-attention should do the job for you. The next question we asked is, well, what are the other inductive biases that self-attention can model? And can it actually transfer the other domains, like, like images, for example, and music? So what is a pattern that's recurring in, in images? And, uh, and oftentimes, you, you, see, you see these notions. Oh, so, so this, this, this work uh, that I'm going to talk about, this, this part of the presentation is going to sort of summarize these, uh, these papers that I was involved in. Um, so images have this, uh, this, this notion of self-similarity where you see these motifs that are repeating at different scales, uh, different sizes, and different orientations. There's also you know, beautiful notions of self-similarity in, in paintings. Um, Music has uh, music uh, uh, self-similarities, ubiquitous in music as well. You have these sort of repeating motifs at different time scales, just referencing each other. There's also hierarchy in music. Um, now, so it turns out that this notion of self-similarity has, has been exploited like many years ago, in, in, in fact, in 2005. And it's, it's, it's this approach called non-local means. So they were, they were essentially doing image denoising. And so imagine there's a sort of patch, uh, this, this patch P that you want to denoise. And uh, exploiting this nature, uh, exploiting this property that many patches are similar to each other, they used some notion of similarity, content-based similarity between these patches. And based on the content-based similarity, they pooled the information together. 
And if you just if you just revisit, um, so this is the uh, this is the, the original paper is a non-local algorithm for image denoising. This observation was also made in 2018 by by Wang et al. And if you just if you actually look just revisit the self-attention module and just sort of replace these tokens with these patches, that's basically what's going on. You're you're taking you're you're, you're trying to re-represent p. And you, you have some notion of content-based similarity. You're pooling based on how similar you are to, to the patches around you. You're pooling information, um, and essentially, just sort of, it's like a, it's like a, another manifestation of non-local means, a very efficient one. So, so inspired by this, we said, well, this should probably work on image generation. So the image transformer model is not very different, except we just replaced word with pixels. Oh, sorry, I wanted to mention one thing. So, so attention is, uh, is, is invariant to permutation. It just operates on sets. If you just reorder things, it's going to give you the same representation. So if you have to explicitly inject position information. So in, in, our, in, in the case of our translation model, we used absolute positions, which are these sinusoids or learned, information, uh, learned position representations, and both of them perform equally well. For images, we explicitly added two-dimensional representations of positions in the x and y coordinates. Um, so imagine if you're doing something like super resolution, you have a 4 by 4 image at the input, and you want to translate it into, sort of in this probabilistic way into, this, um, uh, into a 32-by-32 uh, 32 32 image. Um, now, now here, unfortunately, if images are really large, then you're in this regime where uh, your, uh, your, your length, the number of positions dominates uh, dimension. So uh, not surprisingly, we essentially borrow from convolutions, and we restrict ourselves to local fields. Now again, now despite that, we still will be better than convolutions and more sparsely parametrized for, a, for even a large receptive field, right? Because the, the number of parameters will go will grow quadratically with, with receptive field and convolutions, whereas in our case, uh, they won't because we have used the same parameters at every position. And if the number of, if and if the spatial field is still smaller than dimension, then we have a better computation profile than convolutions, which actually allowed us to have many, many fewer layers in our models and very large receptive fields. Um, so um, so this, we used a very standard approach uh, to, use, to exploit locality. We had, we had one-dimensional uh, local attention and two-dimensional local attention. Uh, and uh, we used it for both super resolution and image generation. Our perplexity numbers were state of the art at the time. Now they've been surpassed by many models. Uh, many, several of them actually use self-attention. In fact, the state of the art model on perplexity uses self-attention. I believe it was, it was at iClear 2019. Uh, it was called SPNs by Jacob Minnick. Um, so on super resolution, uh, our results were state of the art at the time uh, for all of you GAN fans, these are laughable, but remember, these are autoregressive models, probabilistic autoregressive models. And uh, at, at the moment, I so at the moment, these, the quality of these images have, have improved dramatically with self-attention and autoregressive models. Uh, at the time, this was outperforming the previous convolutional, convolutional image, probabilistic image generation model by, by I believe they are accuracies are four times better. These are sort of samples at different temperatures. Um, for, and the, 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 the row on the, the column on the left is your input image. Um, here's another interesting sort of to see, because we trained at maximum likelihood, we wanted to see if you actually get diversity. So the, the, first, the first column is, 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 uh, is what we supply to the model. The rightmost column is the true image in, in between other generations. The third row is actually quite is interesting. So there's a suggestion of this. There's a poll there that might suggest that there's a human. And the model, because it's, learned, because it's trained at maximum likelihood and wants to f explain the entire data, it actually generates some humans there, which is, which is, which is funny. The, true the, the correct answer is actually just a poll. Um, the model sometimes fails to generate entire objects, like in the last row, there's this cute dog, but it, it's with a chair, and, and I think it's a chair or something, and that object does not appear. So, um, so it's not perfect, but it, 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 it was interesting to see that you actually get diversity with these likelihood-based models. So now this is generation. So we ask, okay, so, so, so we, have, we have the ability to model uh, self-similarity in images. Now, is this going to work for, 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 a, very, for a task that's actually been bashed on for years, basically image classification, right? And now it turns out that self-attention um, has been used in conjunction with convolutions. But unfortunately, because uh, all to all attention is very expensive at higher, higher spatial resolutions, they were it was typically applied towards the end of these models. Or it was, applied, it was, it was applied when after doing something like pooling to reduce the spatial dimension. So there's some really interesting work in this direction. Now we, we asked the question, can we have a pure self-attention model that can outperform convolutions? And surprisingly, the strategy was very simple. 
It was a two-step procedure. We essentially just replaced all spatial convolutions in ResNet 50. This is a very recent result, something that we're really excited about. We replaced every spatial, three by three spatial convolution in ResNet with a seven by seven convolution. Uh, the sort of ugly part is the stem. The stem has had a very privileged status in convolutions. It sort of learns these local correlations, these edge detectors, which then, and, and this information is, is sent off to the subsequent layers. And uh, that information is quite important. So we had to somehow inject some notion of distance uh, in, in these linear transformations in our self-attention. Now, another critical component of this is, uh, is, 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 this, uh, is relative self-attention. So we introduced, we actually put in, uh, introduced 2D coordinate geometry. So instead of using absolute positions, we explicitly used relative positions. And, and, and this is very promising. And later, hopefully later on, I'll, 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 I'll talk about why it, where this is going to generalize. So sort of these, the two innovations here were using 2D relative positions and, and, and inventing a new kind of attention stem. Um, so the results, I mean, so the procedure is, is it's like the surgery is very simple. You just replace a three by three conv with a seven by seven local attention layer. Um, and everything else stays the same as a standard ResNet, it's a standard ResNet architecture. And we outperform ResNet uh, uh, when it comes to both uh, parameters and flops. And uh, the, way we, the, way we, the way we actually uh, conducted these experiments, we, we changed the width of the model, so we changed the dimensions. And that's how we, we, we increased and reduced the number of parameters and the, and the number of flops. And we have a better computational profile than ResNet 50. Um, on, object de on object detection with RetinaNet, which uses ResNet 50 as a backbone, the results are even more remarkable. Uh, we are actually able to, with 39% reduction in flops uh, and about 34% reduction in parameters, we get the same accuracy. Unfortunately, uh, self-attention is, so in terms of wall time, you're actually slower. Uh, a MATML is highly optimized, so, there, so your, your ConvNet is still going to run much faster than, than our self-attention, but we're, we're working on building native ops for GPUs and, and TPUs, so hopefully our models will be much faster. But this is a very promising result. Now with just purely self-attention models, we can actually get, uh, we can match. And now, and now the next step is to see if you can, if you can, if you can uh, outperform or get better performance at many fewer parameters that could be useful for sort of mobile devices. Um, now, it, it does turn out that uh, convolutions are still, so we, we actually tried hybrid models, Franken models, and it turns out the convolutions are still better at lower layers. Like, they're, they're still really amazing at actually computing these edge detectors and self And so the, the best model still carries convolutions at the lower layers and, and self-attention at the higher layers, where you kind of need these, this large spatial mixing of content. The lower layers with convolutions detect content, and the higher layers sort of do the spatial mixing of content. Um, OK, so, so we talked about self-similarity in music. Um, so basically, uh, what we did was we trained generative models of music. Um, so very soon, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to shut up, and the model is going to talk for you. And so, the, so how did we how did we generate music? So typically, you would, if you if you imagine the if you imagine the sort of paradigm of going from text to speech, you'd have going from score to sound, but we just sort of cut it in between, and we just looked at an event-based MIDI representation. So we looked at the we looked at performance representation, and we we model that using a language model, and um, then we synthesized it using uh, we then we synthesized our generated uh, events. Um, from when we, when we sort of cranked the model. Um, so we focused on performance. This, is, this, has, been, this has already been done in previous, in previous work. Um, so so the, here's, here's some examples of, uh, of completion. So here's an initial motif. This is the... Actually, much longer than I thought. So, um, so you can see the the model carries over some information, but it just sort of loses its. It, it has complete. It has, it's basically it has no memory of what it generated. So, interestingly, the transformer carries it for a certain amount of time, but because it's been trained on sequences that are half the length of what it generates, it can generalize to longer sequences. So. Was well, the music transformer again? We use relative position here because music has a has very rich. Uh, 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 Timing, uh, timing information, so we explicitly add that timing information through relative self-attention. Um, the details in the paper, and here's how the... 
So yeah, it's it's able to it's able to repeat these motifs. Uh, we don't think this is actually in the training data, so hopefully it's not memorizing. Uh, uh, but likely, I mean, these models could. So it's probably stitching these things together. Um, so here's so now we talked about so here's an interesting visualization of how this model actually gets this sort of self similarity and the self referential mechanism. So we're going to play this and we're going to show you the attention heads. I'm going to show you the attention heads from the last layer, and you'll see that the model introduces this, this tremolo, and and it actually you know, when it repeats it, it looks at all the events in the past. It all looks at all the time steps in the past where this where this tremolo took place, and it skips in, and it skips the things in between. Interest of time, I'm going to skip the jazz sample. But do check out uh, the first author on this paper is Anna Huang. She has a fantastic blog as well, and, and it has re really beautiful visualizations. Please do check it out. Uh, OK, so to summarize, uh, self attention is it's, it's good at sort of capturing this or uh, modeling constant path length between any two positions, trivial to paralyze. And, 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 and relative self-attention has kind of allowed us to, to, to capture this expressive timing. Uh, it allows us to get translational equivariance, which is what convolutions uh, carry. And it also extends very naturally to graphs. There's, paper, there's, a, there's a paper from DeepMind that, that uses relative self-attention to model graphs. Um, so one thing that I mentioned was this uh, the, a problem with attention is that it's, it's, it's invariant to permutations. But in some sense, it's like you're separating the geometry from the actual computation, which means if you know the geometry in advance, you can inject any geometry you have. So imagine if you're doing classification on like on on on, on spheres or any such body that you, as long as you have the information, you can you can inject this this uh, this relative geometry in the model, and the model should actually be able to do well. So we're excited about some of the implications of this for spherical convolutions or point clouds. We're also interested in image segmentation because self-attention has this sort of content-based way of pooling in information that might be useful for segmentation. Uh, some other stuff that I'm, that I'm also interested in is molecule designers are generating graphs. Um, if you if you if you see encoded decoded attention, you can just imagine. Or if you looked at two frames of video, you can imagine that attention from one frame to the other is sort of just catting, is just capturing the redundancies. So it's like optical flow. So you could imagine self attention being very interesting for video compression. That's some that's, a, that's an ongoing project. Um, that's something I'm excited about. Um, this other some interesting work on less autoregressive generation. These are some of the papers. Some of them I've been involved in. Some of them are by other authors. The, the great papers. Uh, uh, people, if they're interested, they could take a look at it. Folks here. Um, and there's also good work on you know generating Wikipedia articles, uh, character level modeling, combining recurrence and self attention. And the last paper is the one that I talked about that actually generates some really high fidelity images with uh, self attention and some convolutions. Thank you. <laughs>